I'm going to be talking about work, joint work with Nicola Pinzani. I see someone has decided that this is already too much. That's fine. Uh, it is a lot for the first thing in the morning. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. But you also want to be fresh. You want to be here with coffee in your hand. Um, yes, I'm certainly hyper right now. Coffee just drunk, I'm, I can do this. Uh, joint work with Nicola on the topology and geometry of causality. This is actually a two-part work. Uh, I will be talking about the second part because that's where some of the interesting examples in terms of indefinite causal order uh, come out. But there's also a lot of other stuff about causal functions, distributions, and uh, shift theory that I will just mention towards the end. The basic idea, and I think the first thing to keep in mind, uh, is that we do not work with a specific theory-dependent implementation of our processes. So you take something like the uh, process on the left, which involves four parties, let's call them Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Diane. It, there's a quantum switch in this uh, red box between Alice and Bob. So Alice and Bob are mutually, in mutually indefinite uh, causal order. And then there's Charlie that acts after them, and Diane that is space-like separated from them. So we have something like this to build our examples. Uh, but what we really care about ultimately is the probabilities that they observe. So in this specific example, we have an entangled state. One qubit, this is just a bell state. One qubit of this bell state is uh, put into the control of the quantum switch. So we're going to have a causal order, which is a superposition of Alice before Bob and Bob before Alice, but where the order is also entangled with some other qubit. The second qubit goes to Diane. Diane chooses one of two bases by first applying uh, X rotation by some arbitrary angle, one for zero, one for one, and then measuring in the Z basis. And the uh, switch has as its input state some maximal state. Then inside the switch, Alice and Bob both perform the same operation. On the qubit they receive, they measure in the X basis, they get a bit, and that's their output. And then they have a freely chosen input, which gets encoded into the X basis. So zero goes to plus, one goes to minus, and then they take that qubit and forward it. And whatever comes out of the switch is discarded, but the control of the switch also comes out, and that control is measured by Charlie at the end. Charlie does the same thing that Diane does. So this model is parameterized in two angles. We'll see what happens if we vary the angles later. But the important uh, thing right now is that for any fixed choice of the two experimental parameters, we get a conditional probability distribution. There are four parties. Each of them has a bit in input, so there are 16 possible inputs. Those are the rows of this matrix. And then each party has a bit in output, so there are 16 possible outputs over which you get a probability distribution. So each row is a probability distribution over the 16 possible outputs for the four parties, conditional to a fixed choice of input, essentially. And the first step in this entire work is to completely forget about the thing on the left. We do not care how it's implemented at all. All we care about is what you get from the experiment. From the experiment, you're going to get some probability distributions. You're going to collate them and say, OK, when Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Diane chose 0, 0, 0, 1, this is my estimate of the probability distribution after many repetitions. And this is the table that we work with. So this approach is device independent. We do not care about how the process was implemented. But in fact, it's also theory independent. We do not assume that this takes place in quantum theory at all. It's just some probabilities. So it's, it's fully operational and theory independent. Now, these matrices are fairly big and kind of useless uh, like this. You can't really go through these numbers and figure out which ones are large and which ones are small. So we very soon started to plot them as heat maps instead. There is information to be uh, gathered from these heat maps, but that's not the point of this talk. For this talk, that's just a bunch of colors tessellated in a matrix. It's just probabilities, but I didn't want to put like ginormous 64 by 64 matrices that you can't really read. So I chose some slightly more informative pictures instead. You can already see that there is some block structure that corresponds to uh, correlations or independence of some of the outputs. So this is really the first step. This is a theory independent framework that only cares about the probability that you get from an experiment, nothing else. No implementation, no devices. However, in contrast to 
uh, perhaps uh, some of the previous work on indefinite causal order, we do want to impose some causal constraints sometimes. The reality is that if we want to do an experiment on indefinite causal order, which involves many parties, it is quite likely that we will have some relations between those parties. Not all of them will be always in indefinite causal order. Sometimes you're going to have two or three or maybe even four parties in indefinite causal order, but the other parties involved will be maybe space-like separated, maybe will come before, maybe will come after. So we can put some partial causal constraints in this. And that's depicted by a directed acyclic graph, except that instead of having events for nodes, we now have classes, possibly classes of equivalence of events for nodes. So if two events are in indefinite causal order, causally they're indistinguishable, they come together. So in this particular, uh, in this particular case, we have Alice and Bob. We do not know what the order between Alice and Bob is, but we know that Charlie follows them causally, and we know that Diane is space like separated from everybody else. Is so it, it is a partial order if you consider it as a, using equivalence classes as nodes, but you can equivalently consider it as a pre-order on the events themselves because pre-orders are the same as partial orders on equivalence classes. Uh, so one of the two, uh, we, we define it as a pre-order, but uh, it's easier to draw it as a partial order. So this is, the kind of, uh, this is the kind of setting that we want to impose. We know something about our scenario. We do not assume that this is completely indefinite. And that's important uh, because it will turn out that separability is a relative notion. It's relative to what you already know. What we don't know is the relationship between Alice and Bob, whether this can be explained by some static or dynamic order between them, but we do know that Diane is separated. Like, we have checked. Diane is far, far away. Uh, and we know that Charlie comes after because Charlie has to wait for the control to come out before performing his operation. And we can, relative to this structure, we can study the causal fraction of a model like this. We can ask how much of this model is, and when I say this model, I have a picture on the left because that's informative, but what we really work with, what the software takes in and uses, is the matrix of probabilities. We ask how much of this is explained by Alice coming before Bob, coming before Charlie, and Diane space like separated. Turns out that's about 40.5%. How much of it is explained by Bob coming before Alice, coming before Charlie, and Diane space like separated, and that's also about 40.5%. Turns out there is no overlap in this particular example. So the overall explanation that we can get from uh, any fixed causal order that refines our given constraints, so we already know that Diane is basically separated. We do not want to consider cases where Diane comes after Charlie. That's not something that makes physical sense. I mean, it does, of course, if you imagine that relativity breaks down secretly, but at least something we want to keep uh, working in our theory. So that's... Uh, these are the two orders that we can consider, and this model is actually only 81%, roughly, causally separable in this particular, or under these particular constraints. This is an example, and it's, uh, it's a very simple example because there is no one coming before Alice and Bob, so there is no possibility for uh, dynamical causal order. There is nothing that controls in this particular scenario. There's no one that can control the order between Alice and Bob. It makes it particularly simple. And we'll see later that things change once you have slightly more complicated causal structures. The first interesting observation that uh, we made, in fact, we were very happy when we saw this, uh, is if you take this scenario that I just described or a very simple generalization with five parties where you take a GHZ state in the X basis and you add Eve measuring the third qubit of the GHZ state and then you plot the uh, causally separable fraction, how much of these scenarios is explained by fixed causal order or dynamical causal order, then you get something like the plots at the top. This is as a function of the two angles. And now if you look at the same measurements on the underlying states, so measurements as a function of those two angles on the Bell state or on the GHZ state, and you go to a 2017 paper by Abramsky, Barbosa, and Mansfield, you see that the plots we have are actually really, really similar to the plots they have for a different thing, the local fraction. How much of the Bell or GHZ model is classically explainable in terms of hidden variables. But there is a strong connection between causal inseparability, so the impossibility of explaining something with a definite causal order or dynamical causal order, and non-locality or contextuality, the impossibility of explaining something in terms of a classical hidden variable model. So these two things 
are related, the plots are, are very similar, they are not exactly identical. So we asked ourselves, can we create a case where there is an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between the two notions? And um, we came up with a different example which involves two switches. I think that's later on. But for now, we look at what happens if you take two entangle switches first. So we thought, okay, one switch makes, uh, makes it asymmetric. There is something, uh, it's clearly not quite the same as the Bell model. What happens if we put two switches, one on the left, one on the right, make things more complicated, makes the matrix much, much larger. It is now two to the six rows, two to the six columns. So it's 64 by 64. Uh, and it has six parties. Now there's two switches and two people measuring the controls afterwards. And this is a more symmetric model. It is also harder to, uh, it's harder to characterize. But we can look again at the kind of constraints that we expect this model to satisfy. And this model satisfies uh, something like this. We know that there is Alice and Bob in indefinite causal order. We know that there is Charlie and Diane in indefinite causal order. But Eve follows Alice and Bob, uh, Felix follows Charlie and Diane, and there, they are these three parties, and three parties are space like separated between them. And I'm just going to check what the time on this thing is, because do you know what the time was? Because I think this clock was... You can go for 11 minutes now. Thank you. All right. So that's 11 minutes. Good. Um, so this is also not the same as saying that we have six parties in indefinite causal order. In fact, six parties in full indefinite causal order is impossible to test for separability. Four parties in indefinite causal order is hard to test for causal separability. There are 576 possible ways that uh, four parties can be in dynamical order. There are a number with 14 digits ways in which six parties can be in dynamical causal order. So we can't actually check them all. Luckily, we don't have to for this particular example. This, is a, this kind of uh, restriction is not just a conceptual one. It's also a computational one. It makes our task easier. We can verify that this thing is inseparable by checking only the orders compatible with this one and not all of the one and six parties. And indeed, if we check and we look at all the possible ways that these, uh, that these two orders can be resolved, uh, we get only two uh, orders which have a non-zero fraction. They are the ones displayed above. Uh, note that when Bob is before Alice, then Diane is before Charlie. And when Alice is before Bob, then Charlie is before Diane. And the other two options have zero fraction. They are not supported. It's because of the entanglement given by the Bell state. If we chose a uh, psi plus state, for example, we would have had it the other way around. Uh, and this, this model, relative to those constraints, is explainable about 86.9%. That's, that's what we get here. So this is also, uh, also causally inseparable relative to the causal constraints that we impose. And if we look again at the separability as a function of the two parameters, we get a plot that's very similar to the one for the single switch, but doesn't have those flat plateaus of separability anymore. Now, there are finitely many values, in fact, only multiples of pi over 2 for the angles, where the model is causally separable. And all other values, the model is causally inseparable, more or less. So it made the landscape more complicated. But again, if we try to compare this to the previous picture on, uh, on the local fraction, it's not exactly the same picture. So we need to do something else. Uh, and we decided to go for, I mean, the next best thing. What if instead of having two quantum switches and feeding an entangled state in the controls, we took two classical switches and used the, the outcomes from a Bell measurement to control them? Now, it, stands to, it is intuitively reasonable that there's going to be an exact correspondence between how much we can explain classically, how much of the probability distribution on the outcomes of the Bell experiment we can explain classically, and how much the, of the induced causal order we will be able to explain classically. There should be an exact correspondence, and indeed it turns out in this case, there is, but it's not immediately clear because we missed one bit of the framework. So far, we've only looked at total orders or fixed orders, fixed causal orders, so pre-orders or partial orders in this case. Uh, but here we have a problem. The order between Charlie and Diane is indefinite, but they follow Alice, so there is a possibility that Alice will control their order. There is a possibility for dynamical causal order in this example, and we need to revisit our original assumption that partial orders are a good way to talk about this. Sometimes they are, but they're not the full picture. And indeed, if we limit ourselves to the four possible uh, orders, causal orders, that you get out of our original constraints, you get these four, these four fractions, 12.5, 12.5, 0, 0. And it seems to suggest that that 
uh, model is only 25% explainable, which is weird and definitely, definitely too low. But indeed, all of these are not dynamical. There is no way for Alice to influence the order between Charlie and Diane yet. So we need to switch gears and we need to move to a slightly different, more general framework, where instead of talking about the order between events, we talk about the causal dependency between the inputs that the parties can choose. So we have, let's take the total order between three parties as an example. We have Alice, then Bob, then Charlie. And then what we do is we look at the lower sets for this causal order. Why? Because whenever we want to consider Bob, Alice is in Bob's past, so Alice has to be considered as well. We cannot consider Bob in isolation. Part of the outcomes at Bob's end might depend secretly on what Alice chose as input. So instead of having just events, we have all the possible histories of inputs, input histories between our parties, ordered by extension, effectively. So we have Alice can choose 0 or 1. When Alice has chosen 0, Bob can choose 0 or 1, and so on. So this is a very, in this case, it seems completely pointless because, I mean, it's, it's the same information as the total order, of course. Uh, but it gives us more freedom, it turns out. And it gives us the freedom to do something like this. This is, uh, this is one of these spaces of input histories where you have three parties and three parties. They're space-like separated. You see that there's no histories on one side that involve inputs on the other side. And on the left, you have a total order, Alice before Charlie, before Diane. On the right, you have a dynamical order. You have a switch order where Bob decides whether Eve will come before Felix. So Bob zero, then Eve means Eve comes before Felix. So you see that there's Bob, Bob Eve, Bobby Felix on the sort of middle part. And on the right, you have Bob one, then, Felix, then Bob Felix, then Bob E Felix. That means that Felix acts before Eve in that case. So Bob on the right is choosing the order between Eve and Felix. That's the point here. And we have two things. We don't just have dynamical order. We also have no locality or, well, I guess no signaling involved in this particular model. And you can mix and match. You can have what's known as an input dependent causal constraint, effectively. All possible ways of doing this uh, give spaces of input histories. And there's quite a lot of them. And if we do this and we start from the uh, order, the indefinite order that we got for Charlie and Diane, we get many more completions, many more refinements that we have to consider. Four of them are the ones induced by the total orders. These are just literally one party before the other and nothing interesting is happening here. 12.5, uh, 12.5, 0, 0. But we also get 12 more. We get possible ways in which three parties are in total order, but the other three are in dynamical order or both of them are in dynamical order. And now we consider all of these and we put them together and we get 12.5, 12.5, 12.5 over six of these things. They add up to 75%. And in fact, those orders correspond exactly to the classical functions in the decomposition of the Bell model. So the empirical model for the Bell scenario that controls the order is decomposable into, uh, it's explainable 75%, so its, it's local fraction is 75%. The six functions that it decomposes into, the hidden variable model, are on the right, and they correspond exactly to the causal order that you get between Charlie and Diane, Eve and Felix, condition to Alice and Bob's input. So this is an exact correspondence both between the separable fraction and the local fraction, and between the spaces that support the model and the classical functions that uh, appear in the decomposition of the controlling scenario. So this is an example of a contextually controlled causal order, which is also possible. And it's a particularly clean example because the contextuality happens strictly before the causal order, so there's no interaction between it. And now just to uh, briefly go towards the end, uh, there are many more, uh, well, there are actually not many more, there are five possible total orders, uh, for si sorry, five possible definite orders between three parties. Each of them corresponds to a space that's constructed pretty much the same way. These are the easy examples. There are uh, up to 12, these are up to uh, event swap, so up event permutation and up to input permutation, okay? So I, I don't care what the inputs are, I don't care what the events are, I just picked one from the equivalence class. And it might seem like you take these, plus you take the dynamical orders, and you're going to get, what, maybe 12, 15 classes. And the reality is that you get about 2,644 of these things, and they fall into 102 equivalence classes, and that's on three events with binary inputs. So there's a lot more of them, and they are weird. They are all possible ways of imposing causal constraints dependent on the input of one or more parties. And you can get things like, things like 
spaces where scenarios are classically explainable, but if you refine the causal constraints, then the scenario suddenly becomes maximum non local because there's just not enough causal functions when you add these dynamical constraints to explain the model. So you can get scenarios where something is useless, let's say from a cryptographic perspective, but if you impose some more constraints in the game using the dynamical ordering between the parties, then suddenly these things become strongly useful. They are impossible to simulate in any way, as in we go from 100% to 0%. This is, this is a 0% no single infraction, by the way. It's a model that is supported on, on some space which has some specific dynamical constraints and it lives just above the no-signaling space, which is at the bottom. So essentially everything that deals with non-locality lives here on the left. That's the point on the left is no-signaling. Everything else is new stuff. And at the very right, there's total orders and causal switches, which is what people working in indefinite causal order have been considering. So people in indefinite causal order want to, know about, want to talk about dynamical order. That's these two classes on the right. People who worked in no locality and contextuality worked with no signaling is, is the thing on the left. And everything in the middle is just combinations of various ways, uh, combinatorially complicated combinations. And just uh, as a final note, the way that we computed those fractions was by constructing causal polytopes. And causal polytopes are not defined by causal inequalities. They are actually obtained by imposing causal equations instead. So we take a simple large polytope of conditional probability distributions. That's really easy because it's a product of simplices. It's easy to describe, it's easy to characterize. And then we slice it by imposing a lot of equations that come from the topology of these spaces of input histories. Like the topology of these determines the kind of equations that impose its causal constraints. And now each of these equations, in this case, it's an eight by eight model. So it's a 64 dimensional space. And each of them, some of them are obviously redundant, but each of the non redundant ones reduces the dimensionality of the space by one. Um, and it, it cuts some complicated slice of the original polytope. So the causal polytope looks weird, but it looks weird because it's a, it's a weird slice of a very simple, much larger polytope, potentially. Of course, you could characterize this by reparameterizing the subspace and imposing the uh, trans reparameterize the subspace and translate the original inequalities of the box. So probabilities are greater than zero and less than, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. You can transform them into the subspace, but that's kind of pointless. Uh, that's expensive and it doesn't really help you. It's much easier to test for the equations and cal calculate the causal fraction using the equations, which is why we were able to do this on models that are embedded in 4,000 or 8,000 or 20,000 dimensional space. Um, so this is quite efficient now. And we can do it for all spaces, for all covers, non-locality and contextuality mixed in the game. So this is now a pretty general framework um, that we presented in this paper. Just to conclude, uh, there is a lot on the topology of causality that I have not had the time to discuss today. There are, we have defined pre-shifts of causal functions, causal distributions, and it turns out that these, the pre-shifts of causal functions are not always sheaves, which is interesting and confusing and somewhat annoying. Uh, and we have effectively, we have just proven that the polytope uh, that you get, the causal polytope or causal tope that you get from these equations is actually the same as the convex space of the empirical models that you get for these pre sheaves which is what one would expect, of course, but it, it confirms that the two objects coming from completely different perspectives, one of them is geometric and the other one is, is sort of a topological gluing of distributions over local causal functions, they actually represent the same exact thing. So this is an extension of the non-locality and contextuality framework to include arbitrary causal constraints, uh, including both causality and non-locality contextuality in it. That's it. I have, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, this is uh, a long work, but hopefully some of the spirit has come through today. And I'm happy to take questions and to discuss this later on. Thank you very much, Stefano. Questions, I'm sure there are plenty. Um, Carlo Maria. Hello, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question. So you mentioned that the causal polytope is generated by equations rather than inequalities. But definitely since, as far as I understand, you're just taking those equations define the boundary of the causal polytope, then of course they also define equations because that will be a convex set. Sorry, uh, inequalities I mean. Have you found, let's say, uh, 
any sort of these inequalities and how do they compare with the standard causal inequalities? Yeah. So imagine you have a, the simplest example is really you have a box. It's take a square or actually take a cube. A cube is defined by six inequalities. And then you slice this cube by an arbitrary plane. And that gives you something. It gives you a two-dimensional shape, which is also a convex shape defined by some inequalities. How many inequalities? There can only be six inequalities at most because they are always come from the inequalities of the, of the shape that you sliced. So if we know that that particular empirical model is defined by 8 by 8, 64 inequalities times 2, 128, because each, each, coordinate, each coordinate is greater than 0, each coordinate is less than 1, it's less than or equal to 1, sorry. Uh, those are the inequalities that define this huge hypercube. And now you know that there are at most 128 causal inequalities that define whatever slice you compute. That is the nice thing about these causal polytypes. They're all obtained as slices. So all you have to do is you take your subspace, you parameterize it any way you want, and then you use the projection matrix that goes from the 64-dimensional uh, space to the whatever, uh, what is this, 42-dimensional uh, subspace, say, for one of the things on the right. And this projection you apply to the inequalities, you get new inequalities. Some of them will be redundant, but there are at most 128 of them, which is good. So yes, you can, we do have the version of the causal inequalities that define these uh, causal, causal topes, but they're not very useful because it's much easier to work with like the simple ones and pass them to a solver and say, in addition, I give you a table of these equations that you should satisfy, uh, find me the best fraction that you can. So this is a, just easier to do. Of course, you can do the causal inequalities there. Okay, thank you for clarifying this. Right. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I have a couple of clarification questions, or maybe it's too early, but um, could you just clarify what you meant when you define the causal fraction? I'm not sure. I, I mean, I just want to be clear. I understand the definition of this and causally separable fraction. Because normally causally separable, I think of in terms of processes or models rather than inequalities. Or of course. Um, no, that's a excellent question. I mean, that's the question that I hoped somebody would ask, because then I can answer it. Uh, you have an empirical model is a conditional probability distribution. It lives in a polytope, right? This is the product of some, what is it? Two to the uh, three minus one. Uh, it's, uh, it's too early. Uh, fine, it's a 56 dimensional uh, object. This is in a polytope that's easy to, easy to work with. So at least we know what co conditional probability distributions are. And now I ask, given any one of these distributions, how much of this, what is the largest uh, number, k, such that there is a probability distribution where k, the, let's call it probability distribution p, is my given, is this table here. What is the largest k such that there is a probability distribution q where k, q is always below p, so can be, is a fraction of p. And now the question is, okay, but maybe when you subtract this fraction, you will get out of whatever polytope you were. No, it's, that's not the case. We proved that you, it's enough to find this to find the decomposition. So the, the maximal fraction supported by a subspace is just really the largest component that can be explained by that subspace to us. Separable fraction, this was the sum over the different causal models? Or? No, it is the, that would not, in this case it is because these don't have any cross fraction. It's, so the fraction yeah. explained by the top one is not explained by any of the other ones. But in general, you have to find the largest, a, a sum of parameters over all of these and a sum of sub, um, sub distributions over all of these, which sum to the largest mass possible. So it could be sometimes you could have a slightly larger fraction explained by a space, but at the cost of significantly reduce the fraction explained by the other ones, because you go into a corner which is not as far away as, as some other phase. So you have to solve a problem that involves all of them at once. But luckily, we don't have many of them because we imposed an order that was already quite restricted. There's only 16 of them and solving a system with, I don't know, what is it, 60 or eight, 900, 1,000 equations is not, is not mm -hmm. too bad. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think in light of time, how about I read out to you the one question we got online while Isaac is setting up for the second talk, if that's okay. Fantastic. So there's a question from Matt Pusey, um, who is asking, in the contextuality controlled switch, would you get the same distribution using classically controlled switches instead of quantum switches? And if so, how can there be indefinite causal order? Well, you get the same, these are classically controlled switches in practice. 
because they are, they are quantum switches where we encode uh, a classical bit into the Z basis, which is the control basis. So they are classical switches, really. But you still get indefinite causal order because the causal order is now contextual. It's a contextually controlled switch. And there's no locality involved. So your causal order is, is going to be unexplainable classically. That's, that's the point. There is a correlation between un the unexplained fraction of causal order and the unexplained fraction of the model that somehow measures it or controls it. And in this case, it's particularly easy to see. In general, it isn't as easy because you measure after, maybe you prepare before, there's some, uh, there's some interplay. But in the case of the contextually control switch, we intentionally did all of the control before and all, sorry, all of the measurement before and all of the control after. So it's clear that they're separated and they're, there's a causation from the contextuality to the indefinite causality. So it is, it is very much indefinite, yes. Thank you, Stefano. Let's thank Stefano again. <laughs> okay, great. Let's move on. And we have a talk by Isaac Friend on the identification of causal influences in quantum processes. Please. Okay, thanks. Um, so, yes, I've uh, written this paper together with Alex, um, and we're saying causal influences instead of the more standard phrase causal effects, just because we want to avoid overloading uh, terms associated with process theories. So one of the uh, overall questions of this research program is um, how much of probabilistic causal reasoning is in some sense prior to probability theory. And we make this operational uh, by asking um, for aspects of causal reasoning uh, that work the same way in the quantum as in the classical setting. And we focus in particular on the problem of causal identification, uh, about which I'll say a lot more. We use multiple process theories to separate the causal structure or assumptions for a scenario from the actual concrete causal model that is the data generating process uh, that's giving probabilities for specific events. Um, so these things uh, live in uh, two process theories. The causal structure uh, is an abstract string diagram in a free process theory and a causal model of that structure is then a functorial interpretation into a concrete process theory of interest, either a quantum one or one containing classical stochastic maps. The problem of causal identification then means we are confronted with an unknown uh, concrete causal model um, of a known causal structure. And we are able to probe it in only very restricted ways, which we call observations. And we want to deduce something about which causal model we have actually been uh, put, ha has actually been put in front of us. And we're going to find um, that in both classical and quantum cases, identification is guaranteed. The identifiability is guaranteed by a certain comb factorization of the abstract causal structure. And the identification uh, for the particular scenario is accomplished by computation of the corresponding factors in the concrete process theory. But to make this abstract uh, talk from the last slide um, more clear, a classical instance of causal identification means that one learns from passive observation a joint distribution of a collection of random variables, and one is assuming that that distribution is being generated by a collection of mechanisms whose independencies are encoded often in a directed acyclic graph. And the task is to answer interventional queries about that data generating process, such as what would happen to variable Y if I were to intervene in the process and forcibly set variable X to a particular value. And there's a lot of um, statistical causal inference literature that addresses for what kinds of causal structures uh, this type of inference can be done. In generalizing to the quantum setting, we face two definitional problems. 
what are quantum causal structures uh, and models, and what should play the role of observational data in the absence of a quantum notion of passive observation. Once we've made appropriate definitions, we can pose the identifiability question, which is when is a causal quantity, that is a quantity that's a function of particular models, computable just from assumed causal structure and observational data alone. So here's an example of a causal structure. It's an abstract string diagram in a free process theory. We're using dot for discarding, whereas the previous talk used uh, the ground symbol. Um, and uh, these gaps in the wires uh, are going to be the places in the process where a local uh, intervention could be plugged in. So a quantum model of such a causal structure uh, would interpret each of the boxes in the diagram as a quantum channel. And then the gaps in the wires are loci where uh, local completely positive maps could be plugged in. And the, the quantum model um, assigns probabilities, joint probabilities to combinations of CP maps being realized uh, when we probe at those loci with appropriate quantum instruments. So there are many quantum models of this causal structure, and there are also many classical stochastic models of this causal structure, which we would get by just interpreting the boxes uh, into an appropriate classical process theory instead. But I'm gonna talk about the quantum ones. Here's an example now of a causal quantity that we might want to infer. Um, this thing uh, depends, the value of this thing as a quantum map thing on the right depends on the particular quantum model of the causal structure on the left. Uh, and it's going to take in at locus X an interventional process, and it will output uh, the resulting state on Y. And the identifiability question is, if I assume the causal structure on the left, and I'm confronted with a quantum model of that causal structure, and I'm only allowed observation uh, the causal quantity on the right, which we call the interventional channel from X to Y. And as in the classical case, the obstacle is going to be the confounding influence of U. So now I need to say what I mean by observation in the quantum case. Uh, because if I could do any quantum instruments I wanted at each locus of intervention, then I could get probabilities of events of this form where I and J run independently over informationally complete sets of states and effects. And I could then tomographically reconstruct the entire data generating process and compute from it any interventional channel I want. What characterizes observational data is that when you find a system to be in a certain state, you must feed forward that same state and not some other state of your choice. So we define observational data as probabilities of events of this form, which can be obtained from projective measurements uh, in various bases. That is, we're defining projective measurement to be the quantum analog of passive observation. Returning to the identification task, uh, the question now is, when I'm confronted with a quantum model of that structure on the left, um, and I'm allowed to do projective measurements uh, at uh, the uh, loci X, Y, and Z, can I use the statistics just from those projective measurements along with that known causal structure to infer the value of the interventional channel on the right? And you might think that allowing projective measurements in as many bases as one wants is allowing interventions that are already too active so that you might be able uh, to still do complete uh, tomography of the data generating process and the task would trivialize. But this is not the case. That interventional channel is not identifiable. Uh, that means that there are multiple quantum models of the structure on the left that have different values of this interventional channel 
and yet behave the same with respect to projective measurements. Um, and similarly, classical stochastic models of this same causal structure have unidentifiable interventional channels. And that's well understood uh, in the classical causal inference literature. What's also known classically, though, is that if my concomitant observation locus Z is more conveniently positioned relative to X and Y, I can use observations at Z to control the confounding influence of U and compute the interventional channel. So classically, the backdoor criterion uh, tells me that if I have classical stochastic models of this kind of causal structure on the left, then I can, in fact, using just observational data, compute the interventional channel on the right. And what we're now telling you is that the same is true for quantum models. So uh, yes, for quantum models of this kind of causal structure with Z behind uh, the so-called treatment variable X, um, the interventional channel from X to Y is identifiable. And identifiability, uh, as in the classical case, is guaranteed by this kind of comb factorization of the abstract string diagram. And so you can see the string diagram actually splits in, into two pieces. And that's what tells us that that interventional channel is identifiable. And when you go to actually compute that interventional channel for the specific causal scenario um, that is in front of you, you do it by computing in two steps the corresponding factors in the concrete quantum process theory. And similarly, if you were doing it um, for classical models, you would do the same thing. Uh, so in both the classical and the quantum cases, identifiability is guaranteed by a comb factorization of the abstract string diagram, and identification is accomplished by computation of the corresponding factors in the concrete process theory. Uh, and so I think uh, that's probably 10 minutes, so I will uh, leave this slide here um, while we take questions and comments. Thank you very much, Isaac. Are there any questions? While we wait for someone to ask a question, I actually uh, will just, I mean, people can raise their hands and you can bring the microphone to them, but I just want to draw your attention uh, to the last bullet point on this contribution slide because we heard uh, in one of the industry talks yesterday about the problem of non-Markovian noise. Uh, and so I just want to point out that um, the kind of confounding from quantum common causes that we're dealing with here um, is non-Markovian noise. You see, the quantum common cause uh, is an environment uh, that is not being refreshed at each time step. Uh, so identification of causal influences, as we're talking about here, um, is very closely related to the problem of detecting non-Markovianity. Questions? If not, <laughs> I have a couple, I think. Probably I have many more questions, but I will need more time to think about it. So the first one is, um, so the result in the Jacobs, Kissinger, and Nasi paper that precedes that, are purely, you know, the same result, just for classical, the classical case, um, covers the case where um, you have some singleton set X on which you intervene and you ask about P of Y do X, uh, where, you know, a P of V do X, meaning you consider distribution over all other variables other than X, so you only consider intervention for singleton set X. Similarly here, now the question is, in the classical literature, the case where you consider arbitrary disjoint subsets of variables that you consider intervention on and on which you want to consider the marginal distribution after the intervention, exist, I think. So have you thought about whether that way of giving a definition to a quantum analog to observations um, and defining an identifiability problem 
quantumly might go through to for that more general case. You, the case you're asking about the case where I say I can identify the interventional distribution on all the other nodes other than the one on which I intervene. So that is the case that you have dealt with, right? Right. Yeah, and th there's a more general problem where you c consider interventional an arbitrary subset of the variables in your model, and you ask about a marginal distribution, you, you, the identifiability of the post-intervention distribution of just a subset of the other variables. It has a different uh, graphical condition that's necessarily sufficient for the identifiability in that case. Um, and I just wondered whether you've thought about the quantum analog right. of that problem. Uh, so I think, so I, ha I have to think more and make sure I understand exactly what you're saying, but I think that um, what we have to uh, consider is how models of the form that I'm showing here um, can arise as marginal models of a bigger thing. Um, and so then uh, the things we call X and Y can be uh, various kinds of subsets that might not be, um, that might not account for everything that's in the model. Um, and we can do some stuff, but we don't even have uh, necessary conditions at this stage for the, um, for these simple cases. Uh, so yes, I think that um, what you're asking about is a little bit more complicated. Um, there are certain things about, uh, the case of Markov categories that um, make, make the criteria sort of more unified. So for instance, you can deal with back door and front door in one diagrammatic criterion, whereas here we can't. Yeah, but I'm sorry, I think I, I, I have to think more about exactly what you said. <laughs> I didn't expect, um, Alex, did you want to comment on this or ask? Um, so, if I understood your question, there's there's actually two kind of dimensions you can generalize this. One is one is the uh, the intervention, so you can generalize from intervening at a single variable uh, to multiple possibly causally related variables, uh, and the other one is to consider that that I don't I don't necessarily care about the causal effect on all other variables, but on some arbitrary marginal. Um, and I think the the second thing was what Isaac addressed. Uh, for the first thing, um, so these these diagrams are slightly more generic than, say, a DAG or something, because a system, so a wire, could actually decompose as many systems. So it could be a tensor product of wires or something like that. Uh, but that really only covers these kind of causally independent variables would factorize in this way. So that case is covered. Um, it's It's not yet so clear how you would write in a totally generic way what it looks like to have an arbitrary configuration of causally connected variables, but it should be some sort of income factorization type condition, I think. So. And we can do some of that. We know how to do some of that yeah. right now, yes. And, that, and I should also say that we, I gave backdoor uh, example here. In the paper, we're doing more like front door. Uh, so I just did this for variety. People who want to see the front quantum front door criterion can look at the paper. So, no. Thank you. I don't know. How are we doing for time? Um, how about we do the same thing as earlier? So the second Isaac is setting up while I ask a quick other question. Um, so this may be just a uh, quite naive question, but so defining the quantum analog of observational data as these projective measurements, um, you know, and I didn't know that, and I think that's really, really cool that it does define a non-trivial problem of identifiability, so that's really cool. Um, but is there a story as to why that should be sort of, in an applied sense or so, uh, be an interesting notion of an, a quantum analog of observational data? Because classically, it's really, really clear why we care about observations. The choice of projective measurements as the uh, quantum uh, observations is closely related to the criterion that was established uh, by, the, or that was put forward by Katya Reed um, and other perimeter slash Waterloo people in their paper on the quantum advantage for causal inference. Um, so I'll just say uh, that it's very, very closely related to the so-called informational symmetry criterion. and. Um, I think that 
there are interesting discussions. If you wanted to talk physically about the cost of doing these things, there are interesting discussions to be had in terms of information thermodynamics um, about why uh, these kinds of things may be, in general, easier uh, than interventions in which what you feed forward is different from what you successfully test for. Um, but yeah, I would, the first thing would be to refer you to the paper of Reed uh, and others. Thanks again. All right, let's move to the last talk of um, this session given by Isaac Smith on a quantum course of perspective of measurement-based quantum computing. Thank you. Um, so clearly continuing with the, the quantum causality uh, of this session, and uh, this talk will be connecting causal, quantum causality with measurement-based quantum computation. So the way that I'll do that is first talk a little bit about what I want or what I want to emphasize from MBQC, what I want to emphasize from quantum causality. Um, both of these, I think, are, are pretty well known in this community. And then I'll talk a little bit about some applications uh, where this perspective might be quite useful. So from MBQC, I mostly think about three things. We have the resource uh, on which we do our computation, so namely the graph state. We have the thing that drives the computation, namely single qubit measurements, and we have some notion of correcting for undesirable measurements. We typically encode uh, the, the computation into the, like, the positive measurement outcomes of these single qubit measurements. And just for the purposes of this talk, I'll mostly be considering uh, measurements in the xy plane for any given angle. You can't do the other planes, but it's sort of not necessary for the, the didactics of this talk. I also want to point out that um, we, we basically do these corrections uh, based on the nice properties of the stabilizers of uh, the graph state. So we have the stabilizer I've called KV. For every vertex, uh, it consists of a poly X operation on that vertex and poly Z operations on every neighboring vertex. This, in conjunction with the nice symmetries of the single qubit measurements, is how we correct for those undesirable measurements. So I've written here that we have this minus outcome, which we don't want, uh, and it's related to the positive outcome by conjugating by Z, and Zs naturally occur in our stabilizers. So we correct for a minus outcome by, in some sense, completing the rest of a stabilizer of our, our graph state. To talk about that a little bit more, because uh, there's a few more things I want to say on this topic, we can consider this conjugation by Z of a positive outcome as changing the angle by which we measure. Same thing uh, when we conjugate by X, we can change the angle. And so if we, in this sort of toy example here, we have a minus outcome on the first measurement, we can absorb it uh, by this notion of completing the stabilizer in these subsequent measurements by changing the angles of outcome two and outcome three. Uh, that measurement two and measurement three. This is sort of what G-flow is, is talking about. I think we've heard a, a little bit about flow um, throughout this week. Generalized flow is something that gets assigned or it either exists or not for a given graph state and given input and output sets of that graph state. And it consists of two things. It consists firstly of a map which tells you for a given measured qubit what is the stabilizer that will correct for it and a partial order, which says that completing that stabilizer is in the future of your current measurement. If we have G-flow, if it exists for a given graph state and input and output sets, we have deterministic computation for any set of angles in which we measure. And this is important because I would like to now take the perspective that G-flow in some sense is like a map from a restricted set of measurement channels to unitaries. And we have some notion of measurement outcome at the present time influencing measurement uh, angles in future times. So this is how we, or I like to connect to the quantum causal side. We kind of have a notion of a higher order map in some restricted sense, and we have some notion of cause and effect as well. So the rest, the next few slides will be uh, basically writing down a quantum causal model for MBQC uh, in, induced by G-flow. But first, I want to talk about what, for me at least, a quantum causal model is. It aligns pretty closely with the papers cited at the bottom of the screen here. But it, it largely consists of a, a DAG, directed acyclic graph, on quantum nodes. I'll say more about what they are in a moment. And quantum channels between these nodes, uh, respecting the connectivity of the DAG. 
So quantum nodes are in particular just a pairs of Hilbert spaces, one sort of incoming for the node, one outgoing from the node. And this is where we plug in our measurement channels. Um, and in, in particular, the, the quantum causal model is a process operator, which is like what I said in the pre previous slide, we're wanting some map between measurement channels to the unitary uh, of the MBQC. It is useful also for this talk to have some notion of input nodes as well, because this is where our graph state will be prepared on these input nodes. Okay, so let's take steps to writing down this, this quantum causal model. The G flow uh, induces a DAG in the following sense. Because it assigns to every qubit uh, that gets measured the future uh, adaptations, X and Z adaptations based on that stabilizer, we can kind of reverse it in a sense and say, okay, what are all the qubits that induce an X measurement on my current qubit, uh, V? We call this set XV, and similarly for ZV, all the qubits that induce a Z adaptation on the current qubit. And together, these are the parents of our node V in our directed acyclic graph. We can then also write down the channels required for the model, because on the previous side, we had DAG and quantum channels. We've written down the DAG, the channels, uh, purely just implementing these corrections, these X and Z corrections on our qubit based on measurement outcomes. So to read this notation, we have essentially the qubit of the graph state getting passed to our node and corrected conditional on measurement outcomes that are passed into uh, the output no, uh, Hilbert spaces of our parent nodes. We go through an example now to make it a little bit more clear. If we consider this single, uh, this quite simple graph state, uh, linear cluster state, and this uh, green thing on the right is our G-induced uh, causal model, the process operator, the first qubit gets simply passed to the first node, it gets measured, and you input classical message as a diagonal uh, state on this, this output Hilbert space here. This is then conditioned, uh, the corrections on the other two qubits is conditioned on this classical message, and we pass the second one through, it comes out, measured again, uh, uh, classical message gets passed in, and so on, and you, you go through in that sense. This example is this DAG that was on the previous, uh, a couple slides ago, and to write out those maps I showed on the previous slide uh, in this specific case is the following. Now, you could rightfully ask, why bother doing this? I mean, I might be preaching to the choir, people here at a causality uh, session that you know, probably don't need to motivate this so much, but um, from my point of view, it gives us access uh, to a new toolbox. So in particular, it gives us access to uh, min entropies for quantum combs that uh, exists in this paper on the left here. And why this is interesting, at least for me, is because you can apply this uh, entropy notion to blind quantum computation, because blind quantum computation is often based on measurement-based quantum computation in various senses, uh, and this is one of the applications that I'm quite interested in uh, in, this, in this way. So to go through this quite quickly, uh, there are many protocols for blind quantum computation. I will go through one which is uh, quite simple in a certain sense because it's entirely classical. It exists in this, this first listed paper here. Uh, where a client and a server both agree on a graph state, they both agree on allowed angles that could be measured, and then the client secretly uh, chooses a computation, which means choosing angles, choosing input and output set, and also a G flow. The client and server then interact by classical uh, communication, where the client reports a an angle that's both uh, obscured by a one-time pad and potentially corrected for, for in the G flow sense, uh, and then the server measures and reports back the measurement outcome the client records the statistics. The way that we can model this is as a quantum comb, and it's a quantum comb that's based off something very similar to the causal model that I wrote down um, before. Before there was quantumness in that, in that causal model, in this case, because it's a purely classical blind uh, protocol, we have something that's very similar but is entirely classical. And in this way, we, we represent the client that uh, as a quantum comb related to this causal model, and we can use the min entropy to calculate how many bits the server will still need to learn about uh, this, this computation before it knows exactly what the client is doing. And this extends the analysis of the blind quantum computation paper that introduces this classical protocol on the previous slide, uh, because we can also then do this in a multi-shot case. So they do it just in a single shot, we can naturally do it in a multi-shot with this really nice uh, comb min entropy. And just to point out that this minimum here is over quantum combs in a specific um, sense. 
So I come to the conclusion. Uh, we, we talked about how GFlow can uh, have a perspective of this higher order map and why this is potentially useful, it gives us uh, access to new tools, and we can apply this to things like classical blind com com quantum computation. I would like to apply it to other blind protocols, as well as some notion of like device-independent measurement-based quantum computation, where, for example, you get some black box which includes the graph state and the corrections of GFlow, and you have to verify that it is actually doing that, and that's what, what you want. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, thank the organizers for a great conference, and also my collaborators in this, this work. Thank you very much, Isaac. Are there any questions? Yes, Alex. So I have a question about the, uh, the comb picture of the blind um, yep. protocol. Uh, so you said that the G-flow is secret, uh, but it looks like here that, that at least the server is going to know the ordering of the nodes. Is that right? Yes. So um, in the protocol, they agree on a total ordering for the, the, the graph state. And the client has to pick a G-flow that is compatible with that total ordering. So the, there will be more than one, potentially. And it's in the paper, uh, the blind quantum computation paper that introduces this. They specify that a computation is uh, determined by the angles and the flow that is chosen, which is not entirely correct, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, they, they use the ambiguity of the, the G-flow as part of the, the blindness. The paper is called Flow Ambiguity Towards Blind Quantum Computation, something like this. I see, but, but, the, but the angles fix the computation, right? Not the, not yeah. the flow. But, but, but somehow, does, does the server know less if they, know, if they don't know the correction sets? Then? Yes, because uh, they also doing, the, the server does this one-time pad of the reported angles. So you, you don't know if an angle has been corrected via some, like I said, correction or by this one-time pad. Yes. And so you don't know if the, the, the server, the client, wants a positive outcome for a specific angle or a negative outcome for a specific angle that's been uh, obscured. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Uh, just a very basic question about the very beginning. Um, yep. Do you need Barrett Lorenz Oreshkov uh, causal models, or can you use Costa Shrapnel causal models? Um, that's a good question. I'm sure you probably could use the Costa Shrapnel causal models. The paper that I cited was my introduction to this area, so that's that's largely why I use it. It's the one I'm most familiar with. Yeah. All right. If there are no ah, there's one for the question. Let's have it and then close. Do you have an idea about how ambiguous the G-flow is? Because I would expect for something with like three or four measurements that it would be two different G-flows or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, this, this is a good question as well. I think you have to go to quite big graph states before you actually get a lot of ambiguity. So there's ambiguity over the sense of they pick uh, input and output sets um, secretly as well. So you, the, the server doesn't a priori know the size of the computation that the server is, that the client is wanting to perform. So that's part of the ambiguity. Up, 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 on top of that, you could have multiple GFlows for a given input and output set. Um, but really, it is only the input and output set and the angles that define the computation. So that's where most of the ambiguity is, is stays, is, is the choice of input and output sets. Yeah. Right. Let's thank the speaker again.